This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you both for the generous introduction. Thank you also for inviting me to give this series of talks. I'm very honored. There are seats down here, so you don't have to stand, unless you want to escape easily. So it's a tremendous honor to give these talks, and I'm very pleased to do that. The talks are named after Arnold Sommerfeld. He was a very important physicist at the beginning of the 20th century. He will also figure later in this talk. He made fundamental contributions in the early days of quantum mechanics, I believe here in Germany. And what, what he's probably most special about is that he holds the world record. So four of his doctoral students and three of his postdoctoral students went on to receive the Nobel Prize. I didn't just mention the names. It's quite a remarkable list of people. This, the students were Heisenberg, Pauli, Debye, De, Debye and Bete, and the other uh, three were Pauling, Rabi, and Van Loo. So I think it's fair to say that he was the best mentor ever, tied only with J.J. Thompson. So this number of seven people he, was, he mentored who got the Nobel Prize, that's a record that I believe will be very hard to break. So he tied only with J.J. Thompson. That's quite an impressive achievement. So the purpose of this talk is to give you a, an overview of fundamental physics, where we are today, and how we got here, and also, more importantly, where we might be heading. But we should start by setting the stage and asking what is physics. So physics is about explaining phenomena at different length scales, and at every point in the talk we'll have to remember which length scale we are talking about. So we'll discuss physics at increasing short distances, as we go to shorter and shorter distances, We'll discuss structure of matter, molecules, atoms, elementary particles, and so on. We'll also discuss physics at very long distances, where we discuss the Earth, the solar system, galaxy, and the universe as a whole. So we'll really cover a lot of distances, and I'll give just one slide of a summary, and then we'll go into more detail. So we are in an extremely unusual an almost unprecedented situation in physics now. We have two standard models. I'll describe them in more detail later in the talk. And they describe the physics both at the shortest distances that are accessible to us and the longest distances that are accessible to us. And these two models are extremely successful over the range of distances that they are designed to work. And it's almost correct to say that there is no reason that they are wrong. I'll qualify the almost, I'll explain what I mean by almost in a lot of detail later in the talk. So that has led some people to say that this is the end of science, and I'm just quoting here, there is a crisis in physics, I'm quoting from famous quotes of, fa quotes of famous people, and physics is over, there is nothing else to be discovered. So if I want to convey one message that I would like you to take away from this talk, is that these things, these phrases that I just said, are totally, totally wrong. Physics is not over. In fact, I think we might be on the verge of a really revolu real big revolution in physics, and I'll explain later in the talk why I think so. And that's where the but comes. The but for the statements above, about the success of the theory. There are very good, excellent arguments that our understanding of these two standard models, the standard models of short distances and long distances, is incomplete, and there ought to be new physics beyond these standard models. New physics that I think we can at least start to make progress on and understand in the coming years. So we can expect both their theoretical things, uh, theoretical problems that I will mention, and there will be new experimental input coming in the coming years. So this together gives us optimism that there will be a real revolution in physics. And it's good to compare the situation with the situation at the beginning of the 20th century. 
And in 1900, the famous British physicist Lord Kelvin gave a lecture. So first, a few words about Kelvin. His original name was William Thompson, and later, in honor of his achievements, he was called First Baron Kelvin. He was one of the leading physicists at the time, and he made important contributions to electricity and thermodynamics, and the Kelvin scale of temperature is named after him. At the time, he was one of the top physicists in the world, and he was asked to give a talk summarizing the state of physics in 1900. And the title of the talk was 19th Century Clouds over the Dynamical Theory of Heat and Light. And in the talk, he highlighted the spectacular success of physics at that point in time. But as you can see from the title, he really focused on the clouds. And the clouds were two different phenomena. One of them was the Michelson-Morley experiment, which eventually led to the theory of relativity, and black body radiation that eventually led to quantum theory. So relativity and quantum theory are the two, two of the revolutions of the beginning of the 20th century. And when Lord Kelvin gave the talk, not only did he summarize the spectacular success in physics, he also highlighted these, these clouds. These clouds that eventually led to huge revolutions. So some people actually misinterpreted his talk and thought that he thought that physics was over, very much like we sometimes hear from people. But it's interesting to read the actual talk and see what he actually said. And what he said that it might seem that physics is over, but there are these clouds. And we should view these clouds as clues for the next step. And he was completely right about that. The clouds viewed as clues give us information how to proceed. Whenever something in physics almost works, we should focus on the, focus on the thing that almost works and the mistakes because the mistake is the sign of how we should proceed. So what he said there was focus on the clouds. This is what we should be thinking about. These are the open questions. This is where progress will come from. So what I'll do today, I'll be very humble, but I'll try to imitate Kelvin. I'll give you a s summary of where we are in physics, the spectacular success, and I will highlight these clouds that point to future discoveries. But before I do that, I'd like to lay out some kind of an outline of how research is done in physics, and then we'll, whatever I'll say will fit this outline. So in physics, progress is always made in steps, and at every point in the story, we should always remember which step we are in. So we start by collecting data. We don't know what we are doing. We watch some phenomenon. We start measuring things, and we collect data. And we have tables and tables of numbers, a lot of numbers. We don't know what to do with the numbers until a smart person comes and look at, looks at the numbers and he says, look, there is a pattern here. Instead of having millions and millions of numbers, I can summarize all the information using a simple formula and some numbers that I still have to fit. So instead of having millions of numbers, I have only five numbers. So I can explain a lot of phenomena using a simple formula, a simple pattern. And I'll give examples of that later in the talk. But this is still not the end. It's not the end for two reasons. First of all, we have to understand why the pattern exists. Where, what does this formula mean? Where did it come from? So we have to understand the origin of the pattern. And I'll call that the why question. Why do we have this pattern? And we'll see examples of that. Second, we would like to understand these parameters. So where did these parameters come from? These numbers that we have to input in order to have the formula. So there are some numbers that we have to put as input, and the formula would then spit out a lot of output, these millions of numbers that were measured. So we need to understand that. And as we explore these parameters, we re often realize that there are many more of them. And as we have more, more and more parameters, what do we do? Well, we go back to the beginning, and we start all over again. So in order to demonstrate that, I pick two historical examples. I'll first describe the first one, and then I'll describe the, the second historical example and see how they fit this general flow chart of how research progresses. So the first historical example that I picked is the motion of the planets. People were interested in the planets on, in the sky from ancient time, and these are some historical, these are famous astronomers, and people were interested in that and they collected information. 
and they had millions and millions of data points of how the stars move in the sky. And they tried to find a pattern, and the pattern they suggested eventually was quite complicated. They were called epicycles. They had models of circles within circles, extremely complicated. So that wasn't very satisfying. But then a better pattern was observed, basically by these three people, in one form or another, and that's the heliocentric model of the planets. So the planets do not move on circles within circles, these epicycles, but there's a much simpler picture where the sun is at the center and the planets circle around it. That was an enormous simplification. So we have a pattern of the planets move around the sun and we have some parameters like the radii of the various orbits. The parameters are not yet explained the pattern is not explained. It was not clear at the time why the pattern is true. This is the why question. The parameters were not explained. But instead of having millions and millions of numbers, there is a far shorter list of numbers that have to be measured, like the radii of the planets, the radius of Mars, the orbit of Mars, the radius of the orbit of the Earth, etc. So one of these people, who I mentioned before, is Kepler. And Kepler is known for his laws about the motion of the planets. But Kepler was most proud of his other model, the model he was most excited about. He wanted to explain the radii of the planets. So he understood that they move around. And he wanted to explain why they move on these radii and not others. And at the time, six planets were known. And he knew of five platonic solids. These are these perfect shaped objects that the ancient Greeks were fascinated by. These were the tetrahedron, the cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. And he, his idea was that one planet moves on this sphere. Inside that, we inscribe a cube. And inside that, we inscribe another sphere. And inside that, we inscribe the tetrahedron, and so forth. And he was very happy with that, because this, this is fantastic. We take a very deep mathematical fact that there are five and only five platonic solids. These are the most beautiful things that the geometrical objects that exist. The Greek were fascinated by this thing. And that thing explains the motion of heavenly objects. What can be better than that? Deep mathematics explains the working of the heavens. That's great, except that it was totally wrong. It was totally wrong. First of all, he himself discovered that the planets do not move in circles. They move on ellipses. That was the first thing that was wrong with it. Second, the numbers didn't quite fit. This is a very beautiful picture, but it didn't fit the data. And then the real kicker came later that there are more than six planets and there are only five platonic solids. So that's too bad. And today we understand that not only was it a bad model, it was an answer to a, a bad question. In the sense that this is the wrong question. And we'll probably never be able to understand why the radii of the planets are what they are. Because there are many solar systems in, in the, our galaxy and in other galaxies, lots and lots of them. And they all have planets circling around the star. And they all have some radii, but they all have different values of the radii. And the radii here are what they are, because that's what they are. They do not reflect any deep idea. So this is an example of first asking a wrong question. You see that even great physicists can ask the wrong question. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. This is how you make progress. You ask questions. Sometimes this is the wrong question. And also we see here that some things should not be explained. They should not be explained because it is what it is, because that's the way things are. So this yet did not explain the why question. And the why question was, why did we have this pattern? There are lots of seats here. You can come forward. That's not the question. <laughs> so the question that remained after that is the why question. Why do the planets move on these orbits? There was enormous simplification in the data. Instead of millions of numbers, there were only a handful or a little bit more parameters describing the motion of the planets. But we still don't understand why. And for that, we needed a great physicist, Isaac Newton. And he explained why the planets move on ellipses. And he also he explained that using the, his laws of motion of bodies and the gravitational force. So he made huge discoveries. And an output from these discoveries 
was an explanation of the pattern observed by Kepler. So this is a great success. He was arguably the best, or maybe one of the best, physicists of all time. And he explained this pattern. But then the great man was very concerned. Because after he understood his laws of motion, and he understood how using his laws of motion, he can predict the ellipses and their shape, he was concerned about the following problem. The elliptical motion of the planets around the sun comes from the gravitational force, the gravitational attraction between the sun of the planets. But there is, we should also consider the gravitational attractions between the planets themselves. And Mr. Newton was very concerned that this will destabilize the beautiful picture that he had derived. So he had derived the motion of the planets, and then he was said, something here is unstable, because the motion of the, the planets could attract each other, and then each planet could either fall into the sun and burn, including us, or could be ejected out of the solar system, and then it would be too, too cold for us. So he had the fantastic insight, first to do all the work, and then to address a real concern, a real question of, is the solar system stable? And at this point, he made what I believe is an amazing, what I view as an amazing mistake. That's interesting. After he did all this work, he did not trust his own theory. He did not trust his own laws, and he was concerned about this stability, and he could come up with only one explanation. Who said that? Right. <laughs> All else fails, God will come to the rescue. So he thought that every once in a while, God comes and adjusts the motion of the planets so that they fit this beautiful elliptical trajectory. And I found a nice quote about that by historian Michael Hoskin. And he said, God demonstrated his continuing concern for his clockwise universe by entering into what we might describe as a permanent service contract for the solar system. So it's like they come and service your heater at home. God comes and adjusts the motion of the planets. Well, now we know that Newton was completely right about his concern. This is a very good question. The question about the stability of the solar system is not only a valid question, it's a very interesting question. But the time scale for the instability of the solar system, we, today we know, is a lot longer than the age of the solar system. So there is no real reason for concern. So this is my first example where we see how we collect the data. There is a pattern. There are parameters. And the next step is trying to understand the parameters and asking the why question, why the pattern is there. My second example is the history of chemistry. So again, at the beginning, people collected data. There were a lot of materials, and they measured a lot of properties of the materials. Do they conduct electricity? When do they melt? Uh, how much they, we, energy we have to pump in in order to raise the temperature? And so forth. There was a lot of numbers. Again, a lot of it was misguided. So the alchemists tried to, their work was misguided. They wanted to find a way of turning ordinary material into gold. Into gold. That was misguided. But along the way, they did a lot of useful and important work by collecting all this information. So there were, again, long lists of numbers. Numbers, 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 a lot of them. And then came the pattern. So the pattern came with Mendeleev. I'm sure you saw this periodic table when you studied chemistry in high school. So what Mendeleev did was to first of all realize that the materials come in two forms. There are compounds and elements. The compounds are kind of more secondary because we form them by putting elements together. So he focused on the elements. That was the first good idea. The second good idea was to arrange the elements in a periodic table. So as we move from the left to the right, the elements become heavier and heavier. And as we move along the columns, the elements have similar properties, like uh, all these are metals, and all these are gases, etc. So that's a nice pattern. And one thing which was nice about it is that not all the elements were known at the time. So he had the foresight, Mendeleev had the foresight of leaving blanks in his table, in the periodic table, blanks that would be filled later when more discoveries are made. And indeed, sure enough, a few years later, some of them took longer, all the entries were filled. So this was a deep idea. There was a pattern. 
he managed to organize a lot of data in a simple form. But this still raises the question of why. Why do we have this periodic table? For that, we needed quantum mechanics on the quantum theory. So quantum theory explained the structure of the atoms and the molecules and the pattern of the periodic table. And this is a picture of an atom, which is not to scale. We have a nucleus in the center with protons and neutrons and electrons circling around it. That's not the scale. The nucleus is a lot smaller. In fact, if we drew it here, we couldn't have seen the nucleus here in the middle because it's so, it's so much smaller than the orbits of the planets. And if we need a timestamp, the timestamp of the beginning of this process is the first Solvay conference in 1911. So in 1911 was the first Solvay conference. It was a very interesting meeting. It's fascinating to read the proceedings because they were totally, totally confused. This is only 11 years after Kelvin's talk. So in, in 1900, Kelvin described the status of physics and laid out these clouds that one should focus on. By 1911, physics was in complete mess. They had, were totally confused. So this is actually a very interesting picture for two reasons. First, this person, who knows who he is? This is Sommerfeld. The lecture is named after him. And second, this one, this is Mr. Solvay, the benefactor of the event. He couldn't come to the photo opportunity. He was busy. So they left the seat open for him and took the photo. And then they took another photo of, of Mr. Solvay <laughs> and glued it in. <laughs> so I think this is the first photo job, Photoshop job. <laughs> so 1911, the first Photoshop. And there were very famous people sitting there around the table, including Marie Curie, Poincaré, Planck, Rutherford, Einstein, and others. So this is the beginning, 1911, 11 years after Kelvin. And this is the end, 1927. Only 16 years later, quantum mechanics was understood. So you see how the time scales for development. 1900, people thought physics was over. And Kelvin told us, told them, look for the clouds. 11 years later, complete mess. 16 years later, complete understanding. This is the way when revolutions are ready to happen, they happen very fast. So among the people here, we can see Heisenberg, Pauli, and Debye. I already mentioned them. Sommerfeld was not there. But Heisenberg, Pauli, and Debye, who were his students, were there. But there were also other famous physicists here, Schrodinger, Dirac, Bohr, Planck, he will figure later in the talk, Curie, Lorentz, and Einstein. So, this is the end of quantum mechanics, or end in the sense that people understood the basic ideas. And the next step was to understand the rest of the, of, I'm continuing with the story of chemistry. We said that there was the why question, why did Mendeleev have this pattern? And that was fully explained by quantum mechanics, so that's good. But we also have the parameters. We hold all these numbers, like the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron, the mass of the electron. All these are input into the story. And we still need to understand where these numbers come from. So the story made, there was a lot of progress. But there are still things hanging out there that we should still focus on and work on. So this is my summary of early history. And I'd like to move now to more modern things and discuss these two standard models I started the talk with. The standard model at short distances and the standard model at long distances. And they were developed during the past few decades, these two models. So at short distances, the model of particle physics. And this is a nearly perfect model describing all physics at all cho very short distances down to 10 to the minus 19 of a meter which is quite an incredible achievement. Very, very short distances, far shorter than the size of the, of the atom. It's one billionth of the size of an atom. So these are the distances so much shorter than, than an atom, we think we understand what's going on. And at the other end, at very long distances, we have cosmology. And again, we have a nearly perfect model of cosmology describing the universe as a whole. And it describes the entire universe and the early universe. So this is, again, very nice. So what I'll do in the coming slides is go through these two models. I'll explain what the model tries to do, where the data comes from, and then what the model tells us. And most important, I will highlight the clouds. 
What are the open questions? What should we be focusing on for the next step? So we'll do it one at a time. We'll start with particle physics. The standard model of particle physics, this is a very long and beautiful topic, and I'll summarize it only in a few slides. So it describes elementary particles and the forces between them. The equations are extremely complicated. So the, we understand the equations. We have no doubt that the equations are correct. But at least in principle, we should explain all of physics from these equations, all of atomic physics, nuclear physics, chemistry, and even biology. All of them should follow from this model. And in many cases, we can calculate things. In many cases, we cannot because it's too complicated. But when the equations are too complicated and we, can, we cannot calculate, it's still interesting to calculate, but we don't view that as evidence that the model is wrong. So we understand the physics and describe everything using these equations, and that's what I want to say about this model. So where does, this, where does the information come from? What's the source of data? So the source of data comes with going to short distances. We need a microscope, and our microscope is an accelerator. And the way we do all these things is we collide either protons or electrons, and we let them collide, and then, whoops, and then debris comes out. So we look at these collisions, we let's say two protons collide, and we have detectors that look at the outcome. So again, collision, and debris comes out. And we do that many, many times, and the information gives us information about what are the particles that come out. Which, is this an electron, a proton, what comes out? At what energy do they come out? In which direction do they come out? How often do we see one, one result versus another? And we, that, we do that a lot of times, literally trillions of times, and we collect a lot of information. The state of the art of doing it is depicted here. This is the LHC. It's an acronym for the Large Hadron Collider. It's in a laboratory called CERN. It's again an acronym in French, the European Center for Nuclear Research, and it's located near Geneva. It's a huge experiment, very expensive and, and huge. It is in a tunnel 100 meters underground. It's depicted here. It's not really, if you fly over the area, you don't see this line. This line was added on the picture simply because it's 100, it's 100 meters underground. It's not visible. The circumference is huge. It's 27 kilometers. And to get a scale of how big it is, this is the runway of the Geneva International Airport which is quite huge, and you see the, this is a lot bigger. So this is a huge experiment, and what they do in the experiment is exactly what I said before. They collide protons and look at the debris. I'll say more about that soon. So taking all the information from a lot of accelerators, this is only the latest of them, the standard model of particle physics was developed. This happened over the last several decades, and it involves two principles the principles of quantum mechanics that I already talked about from the beginning of the 20th century, and another revolution from the beginning of the 20th century, special relativity. This is Einstein's theory of special relativity. And they together give us a beautiful, coherent mathematical structure. The fact that the model is self-consistent is absolutely important. We don't want models that we can calculate two different ways and get two different answers. We should better get the same answer no matter how we calculate, and this model fits the bill. The second element is that there are some matter particles, electrons that were discovered earlier, and then all sorts of other particles with peculiar names, quarks, and others. I'll mention them soon. In forces, they describe, this model describes the electromagnetic force that was understood already in the 19th century, and two other forces that were discovered during the 20th century. This is the strong force, uh, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force, which is important in radioactivity. And there are these parameters. We always have these parameters, numbers that are input to the model that we cannot predict. And for example, the mass of the electron, or the mass of some other particles, and the strength of the forces. So all this together gives us the model. And that's, again, we have principles, some building blocks, and some numbers that we cannot predict. We'll see this thing coming again and again. So all the matter particles are, can be arranged as follows. We have electron, I've already mentioned it. This is the electron. The details of this picture are not important, but I want you just to remember the main idea. There are particles called quarks, the beginning of only a few of them, and they have funny names, up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. And these are different kinds of quarks that were found, and there are also particles called neutrinos, 
these particles have no mass in the standard model, and there are three species of them. When the model was first suggested, the particles were arranged in such a table where all the particles in the same row have the same electric charge. So the electron has charge minus one, and this one has charge minus one, and this has charge minus one. And the same thing is here, as we move along the rows, the charges are the same. And as we move along the columns, the particles are related to each other in a way that is too complicated to explain here. This is very reminiscent of Mendeleev's story. He took all the particles that existed at the time, these were the elements, and he arranged them in a periodic table. So there's obviously a pattern here. And in fact, when the model was first suggested, not all the particles that appear here, had been, not all of them have been discovered when the model was first suggested. And over the following years, these particles were found and they fit very nicely in this periodic table. Very similar to what happened at the time of Mendeleev. So here we are in 2017, we need to explain the pattern. Remember, it's always the same question. Where did the pattern come from? Where is it? Where is it? The last element of the standard model to be discovered is the particle known as the Higgs boson. This was the combination of a lot of theoretical and experimental work over many years. It can be viewed as the keystone of the standard model. If you don't know what a keystone is, this is this uh, stone that is put at the top of an arc, which stabilizes the whole structure. Now it appears in old buildings, they build a stone at the top, it's called the keystone, and I think the Higgs boson is just like that. Its mass mo was measured, it's 133 times the mass of the proton. And this is a picture from the press conference at CERN, where the discovery was announced. And these are the two theorists who predicted this particle, Francois Angler and uh, Peter Higgs. They received the, the 2013 Nobel Prize for the Higgs particle. And notice that Angler is wearing the same tie that I. <laughs> this is a tie of the standard model. It depicts the particles of the different particles of the standard model. It was designed for a special occasion. This was Gerhard Hooft's 60th birthday. Gerhard Hooft is one of the founding fathers of the standard model, one of the greatest physicists alive. And he received the Nobel Prize in 1999 for his work. So leaving the ties aside, the standard model is extremely successful. We explain literally trillions of experiments with a small number of parameters. The small number of parameters explain a lot of information. It's not contradicted with any experiment today. I'll qualify that soon. And it's unprecedented success. The equations are complicated, but sometimes we can actually calculate some things. And the measurements are complicated, but sometimes we can actually measure. And sometimes we can both calculate and measure. Most things we can neither calculate nor measure. So, as I said, all of physics around us, chemistry, biology, everything should follow from these, this model, but it's very hard to check. But we have different kinds of checks. First of all, whenever we see something in quantum mechanics that works, it's a check of the standard model. So every time you use any electronic device, your cell phone, my laptop, uh, you watch TV, every electronics, any computer, tests quantum mechanics. So that's a test. But I think I'm most impressed by this thing. There are some quantities that can be calculated to extreme accuracy, 10 significant digits. And they can also be measured to such extreme accuracy of 10 significant digits. And they all line up. And every digit in this calculation tests an un another aspect of the standard model. So getting achievement of 10 significant digits is unprecedented in science, not to mention in other branches of knowledge like economics, I think the president would agree. If you could predict the, ten the stock market to 10% accuracy, if you can predict it with one, one number, one number accuracy, it would be great. And here we have 10 significant digits. So, did I say 10%? I meant 10 significant digits. It's one part in the 10 to the 10th. So that's an amazing success. We have no doubt that the model is correct. It's not something that, well, maybe it is right. But following Kelvin, we should really focus on the open questions. What are the open problems? What are the clouds over this model? So first of all, 
there's this pattern and parameters we have to explain. Remember this why question. What's the origin of these particles? Why do we have this periodic table? What's the origin of the forces? I mentioned the three forces in the standard model. Why do we have three and not seven forces? What determines how strong the forces are? And there are all these parameters that we need to understand. Where did they come from? And they look rather random. So there's clearly something to be understood. And then slightly more technical, that the model is actually incomplete. I mentioned the Higgs boson mass. It's unstable in the same sense that the standard model was unstable for Newton. If we make small changes, the whole model falls apart. We don't understand why. We don't, maybe this is not even the right question. I mentioned the neutrinos as particles that are massless. By now, their mass was measured, and it's non-zero. So what we learned from that is that there's actually concrete experimental evidence that the standard model is incomplete. These masses of neutrinos that were measured. And the biggest question is the question of quantum gravity. I'll come back to it later. So this is on the theoretical side. And on the experimental side, we're going to have more input soon. Because the LHC keeps running, they increase the energy a little bit, they increase the luminosity, the number of collisions, and they will accumulate more data. And as they do that, we don't know what they will find. Hopefully, they will give us more information. Maybe they will find something very dramatic, something that will guide us as we continue. So this is what I wanted to say about the standard model of particle physics. And now I'm going to switch to cosmology. And I hope that Slava will not complain too much. I should tell you that whenever I give a talk and Slava is in the audience, he complains about something. You already complain? <laughs> I complain about your complaint. <laughs> Gettel could have said something about that. So we have the standard model of cosmology. It describes the universe as a whole and its origin. So I'm going to follow in the presentation the same sequence that I followed before, talk about the model, where the data comes from, what the model is, and what the clouds are. So it describes the Big Bang, the early universe, how the universe evolved, starting from time it was a fraction of a second old till today. It's a long and beautiful detailed story. It explains the origin of matter in the universe, where do all the elements around us came from, and also how galaxies and stars were, were formed. So it's a very long and beautiful story, very almost complete. It's really fascinating. So where does the data come from? For cosmology, the data comes mostly from two places. So the first of them is microwave radiation. This is afterglow of the Big Bang. The Big Bang happened long ago, but radiation came out. And we can still detect this radiation. It's microwave radiation, very much like in your microwave oven at home. And it can be measured with different frequencies. It's like putting a filter in front of your glasses and put a filter to see only one color. So we can measure this radiation at different frequencies. And we can measure it across the sky. And it's almost completely homogeneous. Wherever you look at the sky, you see the same spectrum of microwaves. That's good. But it's not exactly homogeneous. It's not exactly the same in different directions. There are deviations of one part in 100,000. So ten, one part in 10 to the fifth is a deviation from place to place. And this is the map of the universe, with these the red, it's not quite red here, and blue spots are cold and hot spots. How the temperature of this radiation, or how the intensity of this radiation varies as we move across the sky. Uh, this radiation, this deviation from being exactly the same in every direction, were first measured by a satellite called COBE. It's the acronym of Cosmic Background Explorer. And for that, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2006. The state of the art in that is the Europe is a satellite called Planck. I'll come back to Planck later. It was named in his honor. And this is a satellite of the European Space Agency, in which Germany plays a crucial role. And this is what I wanted to say about the microwave background radiation. The second source of data comes from looking at supernovae. Supernovae is a plural of supernova. This is a star that explodes. 
and it explodes with so much energy that it can outshine the galaxy it sits in. And since it's, the explosion is so big and it emits so much energy, we can, here on Earth, we can see such supernovae explosions from the edge of the universe, from as far as we can see. And these three people looked at such faraway supernovae, and they realized that they move away from us. That's okay, because the universe is expanding. So the universe expands, so these galaxies move away from us, and the supernovae are in the galaxy, so they also move away from us. But very surprisingly, they realized, in their measurements, that the expansion of the universe gets faster and faster. So the universe is not just expanding, it actually accelerates, and it moves faster and faster. So this was an amazing and very surprising discovery, which led to the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. So putting all these numbers together and a lot of other stuff that I ignore here, there's a standard model of cosmology. And again, as in particle physics, it uses principles, a pattern, and numbers, parameters that we cannot predict. So the first of them is general relativity. This is Einstein's theory of, of gravity. So that's the first principle. And the Big Bang story, that the universe started with this big explosion. And the pattern is the decomposition of the universe. So we see here ordinary matter, the matter that we are made out of, is about 5% of the total. Dark matter is another kind of matter that does not interact with light, so we don't see it, but it does interact with gravity, and that's how we know it is there. It's about 27%. And a very mysterious dark energy, which is about 68% of the total budget, and this, is, this dark energy is what's responsible for this acceleration of the expansion. So this is the picture we have, and these principles, with a small number of parameters, like the numbers I wrote here, really explain a lot of information. A lot of stuff follows just from something relatively simple. Few numbers, there are two or three others, depending on how you count, and general theory of relativity, predicted by Einstein, and a lot of data falls into place. This is extremely satisfactory. We have a beautiful and coherent picture of the universe. But we shouldn't rest on our laurels, because we have the clouds. Remember Mr. Kelvin, Lord Kelvin. These are the problems that we should really be focusing on. So these are the things that we still need to understand. And I listed some of the questions here. What is this dark matter? These are particles that we don't know about. And it's not in the standard model. We know for sure it's there. We know a lot about it, but we have no idea what it is. Dark energy is even more mysterious. We have no idea what it is. And we have all these parameters. Where did these numbers come from? Why is this the ratio between the amount of dark matter and the amount of matter in the universe? And so forth. And we have to explain the pattern, very much like in the previous models. And related to that is we'd like to understand better the origin of the universe and the fate of what will happen in the far future. How did the universe really start? How did the Big Bang really happen? And one idea that Slava made important contributions to is the theory of cosmic inflation. I summarize it here just for completeness. It describes an early period at the time of the Big Bang where the universe expanded much more rapidly than it expands today. It's a great idea. It has some experimental signatures. It explains some of the pattern. It's supported by a lot of evidence, but I think it's fair to say that there are still many puzzles. So it's not yet completely clear that this model, as we understand it today, is right. It's clearly on the right track, but there might be some details that will need to be adjusted. So this is the, pattern, this is the structure I followed, or the sequence, in the standard model of particle physics. And just as there, there will be more data soon. Because we have these theoretical challenges, these big questions that we have to address. But we're going to get clues from experiment, and there are different kinds of experiment. One of them is to look again at the microwave radiation around us. I said before that we can look at it with different frequencies. It's like putting a filter in front of our glasses. But we can also put a Polaroid glass in front of our glasses and change the Polaroid glass. You know that if you take Polaroid glass, glasses and you turn them, you see it differently. And we can do the same thing with the microwave radiation. This is a picture of a 
a telescope in the South Pole that looks at the sky with, and changes the polarization, and this would give us some input. The second kind of input, which is more recent, that until now we looked at the sky only with electromagnetic radiation, different lights, different colors of light, maybe radio, maybe x-ray, they are all different forms of electromagnetic radiation. But now we can also look at the sky with gravitational radiation. This is LIGO that was just being announced. This is acronym of Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So they just discovered some black holes that merged in the sky. It's extremely exciting. And it gives us a window at the universe, not through light, not through electromagnetic radiation, but through gravitational radiation. And who knows what this will tell us? I have no doubt that it will tell us something, something that will be interesting. And this is going to happen in the next few years, or maybe next few decades. So I talked about these different models the model of particle physics at short distances, and the model of cosmology at long distances. And I mentioned the clouds, the little things that don't quite work. But there's one big elephant in the room, one big problem that is the biggest conceptual problem of them all. And that is to merge the two models together. We have two models, model of very short distances, where quantum mechanics is important, model of big distances, where gravity is important. When we would like to put them together, in the model of quantum gravity. Where should this thing happen? Well, that was understood already by Mr. Planck. I guess he was also here in Germany. And he figured out that if we look at distances of 10 to the minus 35 meters, far shorter than anything we do in particle physics, or correspondingly at time scales of 10 to the minus 43 seconds, these are really very short times, our theories fall apart. Because at these short distances and short times, both quantum mechanics and gravity are important. In the standard model of particle physics, we can ignore gravity. We talked about the three forces. We, didn't we did not include gravity in the list. So the standard model of particle physics ignores gravity. And to a large extent, the theory of cosmology includes quantum mechanics. Because it describes mostly gravitational things. There are various more sophisticated things that use a little bit of quantum mechanics, but not the full-fledged quantum mechanics. But at these times and these distances, both quantum mechanics and general relativity and gravity are equally important. So we should address the structure of the universe when it was 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And this is really the question of creation. Because at this point, the universe was created when it was 10 to the minus 43 seconds old. And the big challenge is to put these two models together. And I should emphasize that this is a real question, a real problem. We know we have gravity. We know we have quantum mechanics. We have no choice but putting them together. So I cannot finish this talk without to say a few words about the best candidate to do that, and this is string theory. This is a very exciting field. Enormous progress has been made over the past few decades. And we've got amazing insights into all sorts of things, but I'll be here very brief. There will be only one slide on that. So among other things, it has led to what appears like a consistent theory of quantum mechanics and gravity together. That by itself is an amazing insight, fantastic discoveries. But it also had a lot of impact on other branches of physics and even on mathematics. And this is really the hallmark of a great idea. A great idea in science is when you solve, you want to solve one problem, you solve the problem, and along the way you, say, you solve many other problems that you did not even plan to solve. So I think it's fair to say that string theory you completely revolutionized some other branches of physics and completely revolutionized some branches of mathematics. So this is very much an analogy I like to make is with Newton. Newton wanted to understand the motion of bodies, and he described that, and he needed, he needed to describe that. And for that, he invented calculus. So that was a great idea. He invented calculus. But then came the benefit from that, that calculus was also important elsewhere in physics and elsewhere in mathematics. And even the social scientists these days use calculus. So this is the hallmark of a great idea. You want to solve one problem, and you solve it. And along the way, without noticing, you solve many other problems. And string theory really fits the bill. 
But it faces challenges. We do not yet understand the fundamental principles. We know a lot about the theory, but we don't think we understand it. We don't know what we are doing. We're kind of exploring it. We need experimental confirmation. We are doing physics, after all, and physics is about getting experimental confirmation. And we have nothing, and it does not look like we're going to get anything in the very near future. So this is a big challenge to come up with an idea how to test this, how to test string theory. And it might take a very long time to achieve the goal. This is an enormous goal. And it could take decades, or maybe even a century or more, to really understand what's going on here. At this point, I would like to mention a dream that Einstein had. And I love this quote, and that's why I brought it here. So we talked about all these parameters, these input numbers, that we have a model. We explained a lot of numbers that were measured. But there are still a few input parameters that, that we had to measure. Like in cosmology, it was the fraction of ordinary matter in the universe. In particle physics, it was the mass of the electron. So Einstein had a dream. I guess he said that in German. There are no arbitrary constants. Nature is so constituted that it is possible, logically, to lay down such strongly determined laws that within these laws, only rationally determined constants occur. Not constants, therefore, whose numerical value could be changed without destroying the theory. So this is one sentence. It's quite long, but it's quite beautiful. Because his vision was that once we understand the theory completely, once we understand the laws of nature completely, there should not be any numbers that should be input that we should measure. We should be determined just by measuring them. Because everything will be have a, a unique solution. There will be a unique equation with only some values of the constants in the equations and nothing that we can change. So that was his dream, and I think this is a valid thing to aspire to. This is a long-range goal, a long-range goal. But I would like to have a cautionary historical example here. So this is a great idea, great dream, but we should be careful with that. And this is a slide I've already shown before in the talk about Kepler. So Kepler wanted to explain the parameters at the time, which were the radii of the orbits of the planet. And he had this spectacular model based on the platonic solids. And that turned out to be the wrong question. The reason it was the wrong question is that the radii of the planets of, uh, of the orbits of the planets is not a fundamental parameter, but it is an environmental parameter. This is a parameter that is true in our solar system, but the parameters are different in other solar systems. So we should not look for a fundamental explanation of these parameters. This is the wrong question. And indeed, the same thing could be true in the parameters that we still need to explain in the standard model of particle physics and the standard model of cosmology. And this is a possible paradigm shift of our view of the universe. And it comes under the name of the multiverse. So the idea is that the universe is a lot bigger than what we think. And the universe around us looks like what we know. But there could be different laws of physics in other universes. There are lots of other universes. Maybe the mass of the electron that we try so hard to explain is really different in the other universes. Very much like the radii of the, plan of the orbits of the planets in our solar system are different than the radii of the motion of the planets in other solar systems. And there might even be different elementary particles, not just the mass of the electron is different, and maybe even the number of space dimensions is different. We have three space dimensions, maybe they have seven, maybe they have three or two. So it might be that some of the parameters we want to explain are not fundamental but environmental. Now, this idea is, I put it here, it's very, very controversial. But it's a valid idea. It's an interesting idea. Some phys physicists love it. Some physicists hate it. I won't tell you where I stand. But it is certainly a logical possibility. It's a logical possibility I do not know how to exclude, nor do I know how to prove it's right. And I think it will really be interesting to know whether this is right or wrong. because. This is a fundamental thing about us, just as the Earth is not the center of the world, and the Sun is not the center of the world, now even our universe might not be unique. This is a deep philosophical question. I'd like to know the answer to that. So if you fell asleep, this is the time to wake up, because I'm summarizing. And the takeaway lesson, 
So the takeaway lesson is that we have seen here a very long journey describing physics over many, many orders of magnitude, the physics of the universe as a whole and the physics of elementary particles. There are two extremely successful standard models in particle physics and in cosmology describing these two ends. And, but it's also clear that there is new physics beyond these models, and these are the clouds of Kelvin. Beautiful story, everything is understood except a few details, and these details is what we should really be focusing on. And I'm happy to see so many young people in the audience. This is what you guys should figure out. And if you figure it out, it will be extremely satisfactory. If you figure out one of these things that I mentioned, it will be extremely satisfactory. And you will be in future slides, your picture will be there. <laughs> but that's not why you should do research. You're not doing research for PowerPoint presentations in the future. <laughs> so one big challenge is to unify these two models uh, that I discussed. But there are also more immediate problems, so sh shorter time scale of explaining the parameters, explaining the pattern, and so forth. And fortunately, on these two fronts, there will be new experimental data coming. So we are in a very fortunate situation. We have something that more or less works. We have clues that point that there must be more physics. And there will be experiment coming in very, very much like in 1900, before the physics world was turned upside down by the revolutions of the 20th century. So I think it's fair to say that the universe, the future, is guaranteed to be exciting, so stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your beautiful and also very clear and very interesting talk. I think we have some time for a few questions now, so please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions now. Yes. Yeah, maybe the gentleman in front. Yeah, you, you can start. Okay. You talked about the Planck scale, like the the time and um, space um, um, dimensions, like at at what the previous collapse. How did Planck come up with the scales? Okay. What was his uh, like data or his? Uh, yeah. So he. Relations? No, he. he he was brilliant. That helps. <laughs> that really helps. But what he said, he understood that he had the Planck constant, which tells us the scale of when quantum mechanics is important. He knew about special relativity. These are the velocities where special relativity is important. This is the speed of light. And the idea was that nature should, you, you try to use natural parameters. So you try to form something which has dimensions of length. This is the only thing that couldn't do. And you can form only one combination of numbers. And you, knew, you have to know Newton's constant, which you also knew, which is the strength of gravity. And using these numbers, you can form only one combination which has dimension of length, only one combination which has dimension of time. And these are the numbers. So in hindsight, what he did was completely elementary, but it's really deep and brilliant. The, the deep ideas are always such that when you look at it, it says, wow, why, why didn't I think about that? So, well, I wasn't around at the time. I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> but, so anyway, that's the calculation he did. So there's only one combination. You take Newton's constant, which is, tells you how strong gravity is, uh, the speed of light, which tells the characteristic scale of relativity, and, <clears throat> and Planck's constant, which is the characteristic scale of quantum mechanics, and you can try and form combinations of them have dimensions of length, and this is what you come up with. And the presentation of this calculation today is identical to the presentation that he had, which is another sign that this is a deep calculation. So it's about 100 years, and it hasn't changed. It was you, you mentioned the uh, string theory uh, as a possible way to, uh, so to say, to make the clouds uh, the idea, so to say, uh, how the string theory sort of uh, 
Okay, so there is a, the main success of string theory is the following. If you try to just follow your nose and do with gravity what has been done for the other forces, the other forces were the electromagnetic, the strong and the weak force, and they could unify them with quantum mechanics. So there's a procedure to do that, and it works extremely well in the standard model of particle physics. If you try to repeat exactly the same procedure for the theory of gravity, you fail miserably. You start calculating things and everything is infinite. Everything is infinite and you don't know what to do. String theory miraculously solves this puzzle. This is the main success of string theory. If you just follow your nose and do what you're instructed to do, all the answers are meaningful and all the answers are there. That's the main success. In addition, string theory, at least qualitatively, can give us a picture that looks like the real world. There are particles, there are matter particles, there are force particles, very much like in the standard model of particle physics. So this is the plus sign. There's also the enormous depth. I think even the people who hate string theory appreciate that there's something very deep going on here with enormous implications in many directions. How we can start from string theory and predict the mass of the electron, how we can start from string theory and get inflation and predict these numbers of cosmology, I think it's fair to say that we have no idea whatsoever. So this is a big challenge. But we, it does address the number one question of how to put together quantum mechanics and general relativity, how to have quantum gravity, and it's the only option that mankind could come up with. So people have tried to solve this problem of putting quantum mechanics and gravity together. There were various attempts. This is the only one uh, that still works. Various other attempts that people had completely failed. And not only does it work, it works in an amazing way, in ways that we think we don't even understand why it works. You just do the calculations and it works. So that's the sign that we are on the right track. We are very far from predicting the mass of the electron. We are very far from addressing these clouds that I mentioned. But it does do this one thing, which is huge. Some people, they say that the string theory is not refutable. Is that true? No. That's not <laughs> I, I could say more. At the moment, we cannot prove or refute it in the sense of experimental confirmation. It does not contradict what I said, that this is the only attempt mankind has come up with that, stand, that is still standing. All other attempts are manifestly false. Now, maybe somebody young here in the audience would be brilliant and will come up with a better suggestion. I'm all for it. Maybe there is something better. I doubt it. I doubt it because this thing manages to work in mysterious ways with a lot of offshoots, as I said before. Now, some people criticize it, but they don't offer an alternative. You know, it's one who would say, oh, oh, I don't like what you're doing. So I can ask you, okay, do you have a better suggestion? No, I don't have a better suggestion, but I just don't like what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> That's not very helpful. Yeah. Okay, I, they, in the last several years, several decades, there's been a lot of interesting interaction between condensed matter physicists and high energy physicists and particle physicists. And because some of the ideas that high energy physicists were playing with turned out to be extremely important in condensed matter physics, trying to find various peculiar phases of matter. Topological insulators, topological superconductors, it's even helpful in the study of the fractional Hall effect, quantum and fractional Hall effect. So there's been a lot of cross-fertilization between these two fields. Now, how this thing will pro proceed, I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I do not know what will be in the future. But there has been a lot of flow of information and ideas between the two fields. But the one you just described is more like a condensed matter 
difficult. Well, they also found various new. You see, the language that we use in high energy physics, in particle physics, string theory, and so forth, is the language that is known as quantum field theory. And that's exactly the language that they use in condensed matter physics to describe matter, to describe materials. The problems are different. All the details are different. But the language is the same language. And we use the same tools. And we learn from them all sorts of phenomena that nature did, exhibits, or that they found within the structure of the theory. So that could influence things that happen in high energy physics or in string theory. And I can go and give a long list of things that people have been trying to do. Uh, let me give you some historical examples. <coughs> Nambu, a famous physicist, also a Nobel laureate, wrote a theory that describes the theory of the strong interactions, how it behaves at low energies. He was influenced by the study of superconduct superconductivity in condensed matter physics. So that's clear. It's in the title of his paper, the paper for which he got the Nobel Prize. So he was influenced by the study of superconductivity in condensed matter physics. Ken Wilson told us how to think about quantum field theory. The modern way of thinking about quantum field theory is due to Ken Wilson. He's a high energy physicist. He was a high energy physicist, a great physicist, also got the Nobel Prize. He was stimulated by ideas in condensed matter physics. And the list goes on and on. And the ideas flow in both directions. So, what can I say? I know there were many examples in the past. I believe there will be other examples in the future. What they will lead to, I wish I knew. But that's it. Okay, maybe one more final question, if there's any. Okay, I can go through any one of them. I could go through any one of them. They don't even come close. I don't think they even come to the point that they can face all these obstacles that we discussed. I can go through any one of them. That some of them are ill-defined. Some of them don't even have flat space as a solution of the equation. They don't get Newton's law. That's the first thing. We like to reproduce Newton's law. Some of them don't even reproduce Newton's law. Others, people haven't computed anything. Compute something and check that it makes sense. In string theory, there were calculations that work, and they work in a miraculous way. The others, nobody did the calculation. And I believe nobody did the calculation because it gives the wrong answer. I can go through every one of them. Some of them are completely speculative. I think some of them do not even address what the, issue, what the issues are. So yes, that, you know, this is something about the media. They like to give you always the other side. So they, it's like, in, like uh, interviewing a famous uh, a brain surgeon about how to do surgery. And then they need somebody else to have the opposite idea. I don't want to give cool names, but they always give you the, like which doctor on the other side. Because you need two ideas in everything. So they bring string theory, and then they bring somebody else to, to counter that. But they're not equal weight. And, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, we should indeed leave it like that. So, thank you very much again. Thank you.